Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence, and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thanks, as always, for making your way here and checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do if you uh, like what you see, what you hear. Hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week, so it's a great way to keep up with your favorite artists. And I'm so excited today because Felicia Day is here uh, with a new project. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, I've been such a, a follower of what you've been doing over the years and, and was so excited when I saw that you've got this new Audible series called Third Eye, this 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 hero quest story. Um, <laughs> and, and I use that in, and it's more than that, of course. But um, first off, let me tell you how much I enjoyed it. I listened to this over the course of about three days and the moments where I wasn't listening to it, it's about all I could think about. Oh, that's such a compliment. That, you know, I haven't heard, I haven't spoken with a lot of people who've listened to the whole thing yet outside of the bubble. So whenever we, you know, whenever somebody who makes something that takes uh, five years, this actually took five years to make total, uh, it's it's really fun to hear that someone completed it and enjoyed it. So thank you for that. That really makes makes my day. Yeah, well, it's true too. And and I'd love to hear about it because, uh, because again, five years working on this, th that ain't nothing. Where did the idea for the whole thing come from? So I wrote a, a, a web show called The Guild that's very well known. Uh, I did it for six years. And after that show ended, at the same time, kind of, I started a company called Geek and Sundry, which is an internet content show. We made hundreds of videos a year. It was great, but I really couldn't make the scripted content that I really wanted to because our budgets really were just too low for that. Lower than The Guild, if you can, if you can imagine, which I shot in my house for six years. So it was really challenging and I wasn't really living my best place. And so I wanted to write a TV show for me to star in. And this was it, you know, this playing a chosen one who failed um, was an idea I came up with because I was a prodigy uh, um, as a kid. I was a violinist and I was kind of a prodigy on the Internet with the Guild and everyone had such high expectations for my company. And it was a completely different company than I thought I was getting involved in. It was more non-scripted, blah, yada, yada, yada. I felt like a failure, even though it was a huge success. So I was able to challenge this idea of a a uh, cliched fantasy chosen one who failed into my own journey. And so I love that idea. And I was like, this is my TV show. And you might see in my background, if you use the video, there is a third eye neon sign in the back. That was actually made in about 2015 when I first came up with this idea because my staff at the time at Geek and Center was like, well, Felicia's gonna go and be a TV star with this. And I think the hype was a little much. It didn't sell, I was devastated. Several years went by where I'm making all the content, the non-scripted content, and I'm still thinking about this story. And in 2018, 19, I was able to pitch it to Audible because I would not let this idea go. And they said, let's make it. And it rolled into COVID. I ended up writing the whole thing pretty much by myself. And 10 TV episodes later, uh, eight hours of content later, 420 something pages later, uh, we have it all recorded and performed by a stellar cast, including Neil Gaiman, Will Wheaton, Sean Astin, Weird Al does a cameo. It's like a cast of thousands and almost all of them were my personal friends. So yes, this is a passion project for me. And uh, I just want people to love it as much as I do. Yeah, well, and, and it is a fun take because, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, the chosen one, who fails? We get to hear all you know this throughout every episode, and in, and and I don't think I'm giving anything away because right from the beginning, like you, we have the big battle. Usually, this is the big battle at the end, and it happens right at the beginning. Yeah, right at the beginning, it's like there's no there's no audio foreplay or anything. We are straight <laughs> there and it's over. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because I mean that's the point of the character, you know. I mean, especially such she's like 15 or 16 when the failure happens in a cliched teenage chosen one thing and then fast forward we go for fast forward 15 years what's happening what happens to somebody who fails everybody and everything goes to crap because of her like it's not a good life and the great thing is you know she has some friends around her there um but somebody comes in this young girl comes in and just bl blows up her world in a way that ultimately is very stressful but rewarding and it's kind of a redemption story but not really because it's it's about somebody grappling with their imposter syndrome um in a very real way on a lot of different levels and also it's funny there's a lot of fart jokes so it's, there you go you get everything here <laughs> i was actually I, I don't know why i was surprised at how funny it was because we i think when i went into it i was just thinking about the sci-fi part of it and then of course i mean you hear neil gaiman right at the beginning and that's it's so good 
Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and for the types of comedy that, that you get to play around with, I mean, some maybe I, I say, you know, some obvious influences in the way that we don't even think of them as influences anymore, like Douglas Adams or Monty Python or any of that, like that stuff's in there. What was the tone? I mean, how did that tone work for you? Is that, is that part of the vision that you had? For sure. I am always lend myself to British comedy a little bit more than uh, American comedy. American comedy is so self-satisfied. Perfect example, How I Met Your Mother. They love their jokes. I love them. I am not a, that's not my kind of humor. I like people self-deprecating, low self-esteem, wallowing in misery, and yet there's fun around it. So that's just my type of comedy. No one's very functional in my comedic world. And that includes Third Eye. So, and then also, you know, I... You know, as one of the other inspirations for this, I was driving around LA and I see these cash for gold places in like terrible parts of town. I'm like, who has gold? Who, how are they paying rent with enough gold in Los Angeles to keep the lights on? And I'm like, well, what if there were dwarves were li secretly living there? And so I started like just kind of perusing and thinking about how the supernatural world could be around us right now and how that would work. And if they're in the gutter, like that's even more interesting. So it is kind of like a rotten sort of, no one's happy in this world. Um, and finding happiness amongst that and friendship and camaraderie is kind of the arc of the story. So yeah, it, it's a lot of inspiration. If you spend this long on something, you throw a lot in there, it gets really layered. It's like a 17 layered nacho dip, right? This is not like something I wrote in a weekend. I got to write it all at once too. And so being able to work on it as a whole, that much, you know, material, making sure that all the jokes are seamless and the arcs are perfect. Like it was a privilege. I, I would love to do it again. I don't know if I have another five years, but you know, three, give it to me because I want to do it again. I don't know if I have another five years. That's that's the self deprecating <laughs> humor that we were going for. Who knows? We don't know. You don't know. But hearing you talk about even how this is like a love letter to the genre, like so when you're doing that, I guess there are certain expectations that you got to play a part in it. But but even um well, you know, as you talk about taking the real life with the gold and the cash for gold thing, like knowing that, you know, you've got these people who have to live underground, you know, because of the way they look or, or you know, like, it's, it's that moment where the genre is so famous for not just mirroring, mirroring reality, but to a certain extent, prophesizing isn't the right word, I guess. Yeah. But like, this could happen if, yeah. right? Yeah, no, that's what I want. And it's really, you know, a lot of times fantasy is about making things bigger and more magical and glossy. I'm I'm not about that, you know. If you look at my Instagram, I am half the time got good hair, half, you know, somebody's paid to do it, it'll look good. If the the other half it's just me. I don't like the artifice. I don't like making people, you know, think that things are rosy and, and glossy and stuff. I want the real stuff. I want it to be gritty and grounded. And so that's what I wanted to do with this fantasy, you know. I love like I don't know if you read a lot of fantasy, Joe Abercrombie is like super one of my favorite authors and like it's nasty fantasy there's swords people are being hacked to pieces it's not this but i love that it was kind of a turning point to really it's grim fantasy almost and i wanted to do grim you know comedy fantasy like down in the dumps people who happen to be a vampire but it's a vamp he's a vampire with no fangs how do you live with yourself when you're a vampire so a lot of the characters are failures in this and sort of following them in a way to get them kind of redeemed or at least in a happier place was something I really wanted to do. And hopefully it feels satisfying in the end for everyone. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, on the, on the dare I say, nerdier side, um, let's start with the spells. Oh, yeah. There are lots of spells. Mm -hmm. Are you coming up with your own language in this? Do you take a little bit of Latin? Like where where's that side of it coming from? Thank you for asking. This was a big thing that I went through. Uh, initially when I was writing it, it was Latin because that's just sort of the cliched, but there's another franchise that uses Latin for their spells. And I didn't really want to have anything to do with that franchise based on one of the author's, you know, political positions. So I chose, uh, and then of course I was like, well, if it's another language, then I don't want to appropriate somebody's language, but then at the same time, I want it to be, uh, you know, different sounding. So if, I don't know if anybody's going to identify this, but it's Esperanto y'all. What is Esperanto? Esperanto is a language that someone made up in, I think, the 1970s to become the universal language of the world. And there are fan clubs around. There are people fluent in Esperanto. And that it sounds a little Greek uh, and Latin at the same time. But anyway, so all of the spells are taken from 
Esperanto. And if you want to learn how to speak Esperanto, there are internet resources to do that. So it's not Klingon or Elvish, it's Esperanto, but it's an existing language that people do speak around the world. I wonder if that's in my Babblefish app that I could. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, you know, it could. I bet there is an app to learn Esperanto. Like Google like, Translate, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think there it is in Google Translate. So there you go. You're the first person to ask me that. And I was like, I was wondering, to, I wondered, I was interested to see if anybody would actually pick up on that. So I did not. I, well, I, I didn't guess that. That's the first time I've ever even heard of this. You know, I, like I, I'm, I now want to dive into this a little bit more. I don't think I'm going <laughs> to learn it. No, but. don't. I don't think it's going to really get you far, but it is. There are people, I'm sure, there are fan clubs around the world where people meet up and speak it. So uh, if you're especially, I don't know, Finnish people probably. I bet there's a, a bunch of people in the Nordic countries because they just have a lot of hobbies, right? <laughs> I love that you specifically went for Finnish. Like, why not? Yeah, they're, they're so like... happy. They got free time. They don't have to worry about their taxes or the health care. They're like learning all the languages. <laughs> well, you know, further on in there too, like, like the opportunity for Easter eggs in this and I, I think that's even mentioned just a little bit maybe in the press release like like you know if, if you're if you're if you're sharp you're going to probably spot certain things and maybe you know the language is one of them but but even like when you have something like this and again talking about that phrase love letter to the genre you know you can do anything right you can tie universes together if you want do yes. you yes you know i'd uh... I think that there are certain types of humor that are super have a lot of references, and I will tell you that there were ten at ten times as many references in this. And I went through and did a couple of passes to take everything out that I could that I didn't make me laugh a lot because a, you know, there is a property brothers joke in there, and I couldn't let it go because I loved it so much. It's one of my favorite jokes. It might date this in five years because people are like, I don't know who they are, but I I I made every joke that was a reference fight for itself. And so there's a Final Fantasy joke in there that I is one of my favorites. There's a Benny Hanna joke in there that's my favorite. But again, I tried to keep it to a minimum because I didn't want anybody to be confused if they I want I like to make universal content. Or and I don't want people to, you know, who might not be English speakers to be like, what are you talking about? So when it's there, it's there. If when it's not, it's not. And I didn't want to, you know, I don't I don't need like, oh, that's an inside firefly joke. No, I didn't do that. But I will say that if you're a fan, you will pick up on enough that will make you smile in a way like, I got that, <laughs> but yeah, not too was, much. Right. I was thinking back to when I was younger and like, um, you know, as a as a teen boy in the 90s, uh, Kevin Smith, you know, was a gateway to a lot of things for me. Yeah. And, and there were so many inside jokes that none of us, because they were inside jokes of friend things, of, of his own friend group. And I remember loving that. And I remember hearing people say, you know, like that's sort of like one on one of things you don't do, <laughs> you know, in a movie or something, you know. Yeah. But I liked knowing that that was something that I didn't know. Yeah. That. No, I agree with you. I am part of a. Uh, I can't talk about it because I'm still on strike, but a movie spoof series that I'm in. And when I was a kid, it was my favorite thing in the world. And I got to tell you, even now, I don't get half the references. But you feel like you're inside. You feel like you're on the inside of something. And yeah, I wanted that sort of belonging and sense of secret belonging in this in a way. And I I, I, I think how, having those little references where people, you get a little wink or a nod, makes you feel, yeah, it makes you feel cooler. Yeah. And not that this is a reference at all, but it's, you know, backtracking as we were talking about languages, I didn't do a word count by any means, but I'm thinking that the two most used words in this were failure and boink. Which... Yes. Oh, yeah, Boink. Yeah, you're right. Well, that was a civil. So London Hughes, who plays my best friend, Sybil Aurora Moonglow, she's a fairy princess and just one of the worst people you've ever met. She's a uh, loud party animal. She's uh, a grifter. You know, there's she's so incredible. And I didn't she was one of the cast members I didn't know before. My friend Jonah Ray, who directed uh, I described the character. And I was like, we need to find someone. I don't know anybody who is a party animal, grifter, loud you know, charismatic person with an accent because we need someone with an accent. And he's like, I know it. Here's London Hughes. And I saw 30 seconds of a YouTube video. I was like, ah, hired. So she is one. I think she kind of steals the show, which is fine. I steal it. I don't care. I'm here to play. Uh, and she is so incredibly funny um, that I, I feel like, you know, if there's going to be a favorite character, it's going to be Sybil for sure. She's fun. I mean, how yeah. can, you know, she's, she's written to be fun. So how can she? Yes. Right. Yeah, but again, she, London is London. She's a star and she's like owns it. And I've never had that lead character energy, even though I'm the lead in everything I write. So <laughs> she really inspired me to spend more on my shoes, okay, as a person. 
you know, easy seg there. How, you know, so here you are, you're playing a teen girl. And well, I don't play the teen girl. Oh, no, she's a teen. My younger version is played by a, a different girl. So this is really fun. I actually recorded it. And when we listened to it back, we were like, you know what? It's not working for us because I have a young sounding voice anyway. And I actually auditioned quite, you know, other actors, we would play them against my voice. And I was like, well, you know, you have a, cause I play teenagers. I'm in Monster High. I play Gulia. I'm on a couple of other animated shows where I play teenagers cause I sound young. And so, but, e but even under that, uh, we needed more contrast. So we had a young girl who I think she was 14 years old and she recorded my lines. And then, uh, there's one line when I'm nine years old, I think. And that was my friend, my friend, Jeff Lewis, who was a member of the guild, his daughter. I was like, can you just record this for me? <laughs> and she was great. It was so well done because it didn't even occur to me that that wasn't you doing those. Yeah. Uh, you know, we so. really, we, we did a really uh, thorough job of trying to voice match me. Mm -hmm. And I think they did an incredible job. Um, except for the nine-year-old. I was like, I think she could do it. She did it and she nailed it. <laughs> the first two lines. It's incredible. So even for you, you know, playing the main character though, and what I'm getting at, you know, when, when you're just doing voice acting and for this character specifically, I mean, is it something specific that you that you did that you don't do usually? Well, yeah, I think every voice has a certain attitude. And I will tell you, I had a sinus infection for like half the, sh you know, and I had to record. And so I was like hopped up on every, you know, clarifying drug because we had to record. It was during COVID, you know, it was what it was. And it actually turned out to be like that sort of slight sickness and me battling something inside, I think actually added to the character, but every character is different. And that sort of, um, you know, she's a very damaged character. You know, this is a comedy, but there's a lot of layers to her and she is profoundly damaged and she inflicts that damage on herself as much as the world does. And as someone who has had bouts with depression and anxiety and spoke it to myself in that way, like you're not good enough, you're never good enough, you're a failure, nobody likes you. You know, having that sort of, I had that in my mind, like a lot of my life, right? And if you have that going on in real life, I can't imagine how you even, you know, pick up yourself from bed in the morning. How do you get out of bed? And a lot of people struggle with that. And so, you know, having her kind of get to a place where she can be okay with herself was kind of a goal. Um, and I think that requires a lot of friendship and support around. And that's what I kind of built around her. And I hope that people like cheer for her, but also are annoyed because, you know, if you have somebody stuck like that, it's frustrating to not be able to help you. And yet you got it, you got to figure out, you got to figure it out. And there's no, no, no point at which you have to, you could stop fighting. You just have to get through it because you can. And reminds me of one of the lines in it, uh, which I might not get ex exactly right. Uh, you can't make a person who doesn't care about you care about you. And a person who does will care about you no matter what. Oh, yeah, that's that was Frank talking to Kate. Yeah, that's true. It's really true. And, you know, it's kind of Hollywood, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you're in a conditional world, like a, a lot of it is about conditional love, right? Uh, being a prodigy, you feel like everyone is conditionally loving you because of how good you are at something. Hollywood's the same way, you know, once you become not useful as far as what you're producing, they don't care about you anymore. It's a business. And, but it's an insidious business in that you kind of feel emotionally involved in it. And you're an artist. So of course your heart is in it and your social world is all about how people's work is. And so when you get dropped in a sense, it's really tough. And having writ written the ups and downs of this business a lot, you know, you really have to figure out what is my touchstone? How, who am I inside? And how to not get rocked by the waves of other people's need or rejection of you. It's really tough. Yeah. Well, and, and and it says so much that you stuck with what, you know, a passion project to find a way to get it out. I mean, wanting to start with it, you know, as a TV series is one thing. And then, you know, and here we are. Do you continue? Do, does the road continue? Or is this, is this where it lived now? Do you think? Because when I hear this, like, oh, yeah, it could also be a stage play. It could still be a TV show. I mean, is that even in the plans? Or do you just now go, okay, here it is. I move on to the next project. I mean, I love these characters. If they had another life in, in, in the future, that would be great. The wonderful thing about this project it is it made me realize I can't tailor my projects to the idea that Hollywood will like them. And I think that's a lot of, you know, I'm everybody's picked up a comic book and they've read it and they're like, somebody just wanted this to be a movie. They just wanted to create the IP to get option, right? Everybody read, you know, it just happens. And for years I tried to sell TV shows and produce them and, you know, 
I started warping myself like every Hollywood writer does into what will the buyer want? But that wasn't what made me happy. That's not my path. I want to write the story I want to write regardless of whether this you know, business will like it. And one day they might, and that would be great. And they won't, but that's not going to dictate the ideas I come up with. So I have another audio project that I just did on my own that'll hopefully come out next year. I have a graphic novel that I'm, um, it's going to be out, uh, not next year, but maybe the year after. Anyway, I have a stage play I'm working on. So everything I'm working on now as, as a writer is stuff I can control. And that way I can do the acting and the hosting and not worry about my heart getting crushed in that way because my writing is super personal and you know that's just not me and and accepting that about myself has been such a freeing experience and this project really allowed me to do that you make it really fun for us to be a fan and i mean that oh, thank you i appreciate it well i wouldn't be here without fans because again hollywood is not like yay felicia day but you know when i go to a convention and somebody like makes me the first piece of third eye fan art which is this mug in my hand and I, I just am like, hey, you have good ideas. Just because this institution doesn't love them all the time doesn't mean that you shouldn't make them. And um, emotionally, you know, I wouldn't be here without fans. So thank you for, you know, thank you, all you fans out there. Thank you for allowing me to do what I do. Yeah. Um, props on uh, to some others while we're here before I go, because uh, I should point out the music in Third Eye is so good because... I took notes every single at the end of every single episode because I've like I've never heard this song and I like this and I wrote uh, Della Rosso, uh, Thomas Michael Thrasher I think was one of them, Bill Martin if you, this is what came up when I shazammed them anyway so I'm hoping the right I love it the music is so good in this series thank you for that I had a playlist I played and none of the none of the songs are on there so I have a playlist I'm going to release it on my Spotify or whatever because I want people to hear what I listened to for the last five years. But we couldn't license anything because, you know, it's it's a format that it's tricky to do music. I will say Mumble, the post-production house who did all the editing, the post, and all the soundtracks, they're from San Francisco. And so when they heard my vibe of like, I love, you know, Fairport Convention. I love these sort of uh, folk kind of rock that feel like they could have been made in the 60s in San Francisco. They nailed it. They actually... There's one piece of music that we didn't even get to use that they went down to Fisherman's Wharf and recorded uh, on site the sound of the arcade there because they wanted to incorporate it and it didn't work for the piece. But that's the attention to detail that they had. And so you're right. I discovered so many wonderful, wonderful tracks and they were all, you know, in the library that we could use. But wow. And then Jonah, I will say that Jonah and Matt, the executive at Audible, they also did amazing input. And, you know, I'm a musician. But for some reason, soundtrack was not my forte and having them on my side to really get this to the point where I'm like, oh, this song is so perfect. It that really as an audiophile, I'm so honored that you you thought that because I I feel like it's one of the best parts of it as well. Well, I, I also can't wait to hear what else is on this playlist. I mean, g give me something. And we've heard Fairport Convention. What else is what else? Oh, what else is OK, good? well, I can I can look on here. I mean, I will say that Trey Adonacio Scabbard was like the the. Um, the sound, you know, the the opening theme song I always wanted. Um, what is? I mean, there are a lot of very uh, diverse bands. I will tell you that, and I'm looking it up right now because I'm, I'm so excited to talk about it. Um, uh, uh, Unknown Mortal Orchestra, one of the bands that I love. Doctor Dog, uh, Summer Camp, First Aid Kit is one of my favorite bands. So there's a uh, Harry Nil Nilsson. Mm -hmm. track on there uh crystal fighters is one uh it's a a song called at home and that's my dream montage song where everyone's running i didn't get to use it but yeah there's and there's a lot of classical music on it as well because there is a classical there's sort of an arc between two characters where they're talking about a lot about opera or art songs and i was a classical musician so uh, being able to do this really nerdy obscure arc is something like they would never let me do this in hollywood let's do it we couldn't use again the actual songs it was just complicated but at the end of the day we get to quote barely oats and i'm like oh i got it <laughs> very funny part of the whole thing and i love uh i love the dr dog guys i've known them forever and first aid kits um I love first aid kit. Lot of, yeah a lot around our house on top of that they're on the new mm -hmm. they're on the new m ward album they guest mm. with him and they do a song called uh, Too Young to Die. And oh, I'm going to have to look it up because yeah. I am a mom now and I listen to Halloween songs 24-7. So <laughs> you go. need to get cool again. <laughs> it's it's perfect for that one. Well, I do love it. I, I do love the music in this. And um, you mentioned San Francisco. 
why was it why did you land on san francisco as the as the uh the home for me well i think it's that sort of a magical 60s idea that there could be hidden supernatural creatures there there's a sort of rotten decadence to san francisco and when i was driving around there at, at one point i was looking at these queen anne houses and i was like oh i could see a psychic neon sign in one of these with this peeling paint and i could see somebody being a failure in there i could see a, a, a hidden vampire living there in secret i think san francisco is a place where you could be pretty much anything and no one's going to give you a second look which is you know it could be scary, but it could also be amazing. And yeah, I just, I love the idea that you have this underground world. And I think that in San Francisco would be, I mean, Los Angeles too, but San Francisco just felt like, especially bringing the music into it and the vibe, um, I, I felt like that was the best place to set this. Yeah. No, it, it it painted the picture right from the beginning. Oh, good. Well, that's a lot. A lot of it is mumble, you know, like a lot of that ambiance and stuff is because they're from San Francisco and they really responded to that attention to detail in a way I never, I don't think anybody else could have. Yeah. Um, do you have a problem with the decade of the 2000s? Why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you got, I'm not taking up for the 2000s, by the way, but I feel like it got trashed pretty good throughout the series here and you there. You know? I mean, just look at my age, okay? Like, I tried not to date it, but I certainly, like, gave a kick in the past. Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, Laurel is kind of caught 15 years ago, right? She's caught in this time that I make fun of a lot, right? Because that was real she where she ended. When she failed, she stopped growing and she stopped becoming anything new, right? And so she, and um, I, there's a character who is literally caught in that time that I don't want to spoil anything, but... Um, yeah, she's caught in this time where she everything she thought about herself uh, fell apart, and then she was kind of frozen in time herself. So, yeah, and they were they were kind of wretched. Let's be honest, the hair was awful, the music was not great, and I lived through that. That was when I, you know, was in LA trying to be an actor. They were awful times. Okay, so yes, they suck. <laughs> oh, the two thousands. <laughs> I, mean, I can take up for things like Death Cab for Cutie and Spoon and stuff like that, but sure. Okay, I, I love Death Crab. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll yeah. give you Death Cab. But That's also it. we had Hollaback Girl and everything else. So it's. Uh, I yeah. mean, again, when you're drunk, Hollaback Girl's okay. Like <laughs> <laughs> When you're drunk, anything's okay. So I'm No, not really sure. no, no, no. You think there's That's still a, a line? Nickelback. Oh, okay. I mean, there are a lot of, that, there are a lot of bands. I No, no. All right. I, Red Hot Chili Peppers kind of for me. Mm. No. Unless you're playing the 80s funk, that's uh, it's one of those bands you can't get away from after that. So No, it's... no. Anything that's going to be boomer now is going to be not for me, okay? Sure. All right, you win. You win on that one. You won me Thank over. You. That's, uh... Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Third Eye is so, so good. I really love this series. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it. This has been so fun. Thank you so much. I hope a lot of other people enjoy it. So, And this has been a great conversation. Thanks for having me. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you. For, uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week. New and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.